Okay, I think we may begin now. So I thank everybody who has joined us and we may see a few more participants join us soon. Welcome to our very first ever Women in Architectural, Women in Architecture virtual event. My name is Kate Gerson and I'm a member of WIA's programming committee. And um, I'm going to be acting as the host for this event. Um, we have it set up as a webinar with Zoom. And please bear with us because this is our first time doing a Zoom webinar and hosting a Zoom webinar. So um, please forgive us for whatever fumbling we end up doing in the process. We'll do our best. Um, I especially appreciate seeing such a fantastic turnout, given that I realize that everybody seems to be getting a certain amount of Zoom fatigue these days. So thanks especially for joining us. Um, a bit about women in architecture. We are always looking for volunteers. Uh, so if you are interested in helping out in there are various ways you can do so. You could join a committee. When we're having live events again, we can always use help at the specific events. And so there are various sort of levels of ways one can volunteer helping out with women in architecture. And if you're interested in potentially doing so, please go to our website, weavancouver.org, I think it is, um, and you'll find some links there. Um, in terms of the, this Zoom webinar, in case people aren't totally familiar with how it works, there are a few ways you can communicate with us because we can't see any of you participants, um, but you can send us messages on chat and I see that there are already a few there, which is great. You can also, um, there's a Q&A button. Um, Kate, you're muted. Here, I've been talking away and nobody's been hearing me. Was I muted all along or I just muted yeah, now? Just for a couple of seconds. Just, okay, yeah. good. So there's the chat option. Hopefully people heard that. And then there's the Q&A option if you want to post questions to our presenter, Anna Maria, and we can read those to her and she will respond. And then there's also a little symbol of a hand. You can raise your hand if you want to be able to make a comment or actually speak to ask a question. And hopefully I will notice that and give you that opportunity. So um, I'll do my best at that. Um, also, if you are looking for an AIBC credit, we will ask you at the end to send your um, name and email address, just to address it through the chat line, um, just address it to the panelists rather than to everybody. And then we'll have, have that record for you. Um, I'm going to introduce Roxana Abdullahi, who was the main organizer of this event. And she has a bit of a a few questions she's going to ask people. Roxana. Thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first virtual event. It's great to see so many of you join. As this is our first virtual event, we would like to have a casual survey and ask you a few questions. Uh, question number one, are you ready? How many are you joining a VIA event for the first time? Uh, could you raise your hand or write in the chat and let us know how many of you are joining for the first time? Ooh, so many people are joining for the first time. 23, oh wow. 20, about 30 people are joining us for the first time. Welcome, special welcome to you joining us for the first time. So now I'm going to ask you question number two. If you're joining from outside of Greater Vancouver, 
please type your location. We would like to know how many of you are joining from other provinces or cities. We have people from Toronto, London, Ontario, Winnipeg, Edmonton, more Toronto, Montreal, Abs Abbotsford, Singapore, Bowen Island. It's very interesting to see all of you joining from so many different places. This and is one of the benefits of doing a virtual event. Yes. Last but not least, how many people are still working remotely? Um, if you're still working remotely, uh, could you raise your hands? Sixty-three people are still working remotely. Approximately half of us. These are surely unprecedented times and hope everyone is well and healthy. Now back to you, Kate. Thank you for participating also in the survey. Thank you, Roxana. So again, just a reminder, now you all have a bit of experience with the chat and the raise hand options and I see one person sent a message through the Q&A option. So just a reminder of those ways of communicating with us. And again, um, if you need AIBC credit to send a message with your name and your email address, just address it to the panelists through the chat. Um, oh, and one other thing I'd like everybody to realize that we are recording this event and um, we will make it available afterward through our website. If anybody um, who was unable to attend or wants to review it, uh, it will be available. And now Roxana, back to you. Thank you, Kate. Now, without any further ado, it's my honor to introduce Ana Maria Yanis, our speaker for this event. Anna Maria leads the Vancouver Studio of Diamond Schmidt Architects and has over 20 years experience with the firm. Her work is focused on Western Canada, including institutional healthcare facilities, performing arts, residential, commercial, restoration, and academic projects. She is a graduate of UBC School of Architecture and rooted in West Coast lifestyle of British Columbia. She was recently recognized at the 2020 Influential Women in Business Awards as one of BC's most outstanding businesswomen in the private or public sector company. She was the project architect for the recently completed Emily Carr University of Art and Design. In addition, as executive architect for the large Oak Ridge redevelopment, she is leading Diamond Schmidt's involvement to deliver residential towers, the civic center, and the interior design of the retail areas. She is well versed in a wide range of delivery methods and has completed projects using integrated project delivery IPD, stipulated sum construction management and private public partnership P3 models. She has successfully delivered IPD projects in Ontario and Alberta and has spoken about this highly collaborative delivery method at a number of events as she is a great advocate for collaborative design processes and methodologies. As this year's VIA's focus is on collaboration, we welcome Anna Maria to discuss and present integrated project delivery. Please, Anna Maria, and thank you. Thank you, Roxana, and thank you, Kate, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. Uh, before I start, uh, and on behalf of Diamond Schmidt Architects, I'd like to acknowledge with respect that our office is located on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. As Roxana mentioned, these are unprecedented times, and we really, really uh, appreciate uh, the turnout. It's really amazing. Uh, I'll do my best to, to recreate the camaraderie and the closeness, you know, that you feel when you're all in the same physical space. But here we are. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have um, um, 
PowerPoint that I've prepared for today. Um, if everyone can see my screen, if that works. So um, Roxana has done a, a lengthy introduction, so um, I'll just jump right into uh, my presentation. Uh, Diamond Schmidt, a little bit about us, about uh, over 300 of us. Uh, head office is in Toronto. We have uh, the Vancouver studio, which we opened about three and a half years ago. There are 30 of us in Vancouver. We also have a third office in New York. We are involved in a number of projects across Canada, the US and, and outside um, uh, of North America. Uh, we have been involved in a number of performing arts buildings, healthcare, facilities, uh, libraries, community centers, residential projects and cultural projects. But today I, I'm excited to share uh, our IPD experience. Um, I've been speaking about IPD ever since I uh, joined my first uh, IPD project uh, at St. Jerome's University. Um, um, this is now goes, goes back um almost eight years ago when we started the project and since then we've had the wonderful opportunity to participate in other ipd projects including uh the two oak belt projects that uh, are near completion now we're involved in another project uh, for the town of okotoks just south of calgary and we also have our fifth ipd project that's underway quite a large one for Cum humber college St. Jerome's, as I mentioned, uh, was our first IPD project, $47 million complex project that involved both um, a student res uh, residence project and an academic building, as well as the implementation of a very large scale master plan that, uh, that included a master plan for the entirety of the campus. Then um, following or overlapping with the tail end of St. Jerome's, we were engaged to uh, uh, working on an IPD project for the town of Oakville, the Trafalgar Park project, which involved the renovation of a large arena and fire hall. And then we were involved in the second part of the town of Oakville project with our involvement with the Southeast Community Center, uh, which involved the recladding of a parking garage uh, community center, which included a pool and gymnasium, and as well as all of the surrounding landscape and open spaces. We're currently involved in this project, which is called the Arts and uh, Learning Campus for the town of Okotoks, which is just at about an hour south of Calgary. It's a highly complex project that also um, that involves uh, a performing a large scale performing arts building uh, as well as a mixed-use building that is a combined library, high school and administrative spaces associated with the high school and a renovation of an existing building that's currently on, on, on the site. Um, Humber College is also um, uh, an IPD project, large-scale project that involves academic spaces, performing art spaces and a student residence. We are only in the SD phases of phase of this project at, as we speak. Um, in terms of our agenda for today, I will touch on um, briefly on the history of IPD and the nature of the contract phases, some of the tools associated with the IPD process, compensation and tracking systems. I'll focus on uh, a case study. Uh, and uh, I'll finish my presentation with the lessons that we've learned uh, from all of these projects. Starting with the history of IPD, uh, IPD or alliancing um, is what it's called or initially called in the, US, in the UK. Um, this process was first developed in the 90s um, with the North Sea oil field development, which is not uh, a building, but it's a complex engineering project that was followed by the Australian Wandu B development, which is an offshore oil platform that was successfully completed in 97. 
The US has over 60 IPD projects, uh, roughly half of them are hospitals. And uh, the first IPD project in Canada was the Moose Jaw Hospital completed in 2012, that was eight years ago. IPD is strong in Alberta. There are many IPD projects in Alberta, as well as in Ontario. In terms of the breakdown of projects in the US, as I mentioned, the 60 projects break down roughly, about half of them are hospital, but the other half are, you find them in really a whole diverse range of sectors. And in terms of scales as well, uh, you know, the hospitals tend to be large scale projects, but it is not uncommon to see IPD projects of a much smaller scale, uh, as small as a, you know, $5 million IPD. Uh, so what is IPD? The AIA has this uh, a description and, and a definition of, of this process as a project delivery approach that integrates people, systems, business structures and practices into a process that collaboratively harnesses the talents and insight of all participants to optimize project results, increase value to the owner, reduce waste and maximize efficiency through all project phases including fabrication and construction. Um, at a minimum is a three-way contractual agreement between an owner, architect, and contractor, but it can have more uh, parties involved in the contract. It reduces the legal recourse for the signatories should the project go um, the wrong way. The IPD contract encourages the team to cooperate and seek mutually acceptable resolutions to design and construction problems, since profitability for all is tied to the overall project success. So how does IPD work? Um, it, initially, um, you will start with a letter of intent um, for all of the project, the, the IPD projects that we have been involved in. They, they generally tend to be complex projects that, that are hard to define in an RFP process. And, and it is because of this complexity that we've seen that some owners are attracted to an IPD process. So once you have a letter of intent, you start the process and you go through a validation process. Once the validation process is complete um, and approved, an IPD contract is signed. And I'll touch on what validation means. Um, the multi-party contract then is, is signed by the owner, architect, and DC. The, an IPD project is generally managed by a core team, uh, or PMT, which stands for Project Management Team. And the composition of the Project Management Team, or PMT, is generally the owner, architect, and GC, but there could be more people uh, that are part of the PMT, and I'll get into that a little bit later in my presentation. Generally, IPD projects, you know, you, you see a, um, a very small, if not, you know, an absence of change orders and RFIs. And the reason for that has to do with the fact that um, because there are so many people involved from the beginning, including all of the full consultant team, and the trades, uh, there is a great deal of knowledge from the onset of the project that is carried by the entirety of the team. So with all of that knowledge, right, the, the need for change orders and, and RFIs is significantly reduced. And IPD projects have financial incentives with a risk and incentive pool. And I'll talk about what that means a little bit later. Our, the town of Okotoks project was the first project, um, the first IPD project that we were involved in, where we were able to utilize the CCDC 30, which is an IPD contract, a dedicated IPD contract, which was first available in 2019. So it's relatively new. Prior to that, we operated um, uh, with different types of agreements, which were largely US-based, and we worked with uh, different advisors to structure those agreements. But in Canada, a CCDC 30 is now available and is being widely used 
on, project, on IPD projects across the country. So how is it different? Uh, what's the, 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 what are the general set of differences between an IPD contract and a lump sum contract? Uh, an IPD contract specifies behaviors. Uh, a, a lump sum contract specifies in detail materials and quantities. An IPD contract, uh, a team develops management processes that are specific to the requirements of the project. A lump sum contract is typically where you see industry standard construction management procedures. In an IPD contract, all risk is managed jointly by IPD partner. Uh, nowhere, there's really nowhere to transfer risk. Uh, in a lump sum contract, risks are uh, individually managed, subdivided, and assigned to parties. In an IPD contract, processes are fluid. They're digital, they're concurrent, they're collaborative. In a lump sum contract, processes are generally paper-based. They tend to be linear and more siloed. In an IPD contract, problems are solved by the whole team. In a lump sum contract, it doesn't quite work out that way. You know, there, there's a general tendency to, to point responsibilities to individual parties rather than a whole more holistic approach. An IPD contract, um, active risk management generally leads to better documents, execution, and risk elimination. In a lump sum contract, typically results um, in conflict and delay and potential additional costs. So in terms of, you know, how is it different? I'd say the, the biggest difference comes from collaboration and how embedded collaboration is in the contract and the day-to-day um, operations and the day-to-day -day delivery of the project. In terms of project phases, you typically see uh, for a validation phase, which is the process where you confirm the scope and you confirm that that scope can be built within a budget. Uh, a validation report is something, is a report that you assemble after you've gone through the validation phase, it could be fairly detailed or it could be fairly diagrammatic and high level. Uh, it, this report in the case of St. Jerome's contain room data sheets, a project budget, outline specifications, design briefs from the engineering disciplines, disciplines BIM protocols, etc. cetera. And uh, with the completion of the validation report and the signatures, and the approval of the validation report is effectively what allows the commitment to proceed with the next phases of the project. The planning phase of the project um, are what we know uh, in, the, in the traditional uh, delivery methods as SD, DD, and construction documents. But depending on the level of detail of the validation report, in the case of St. Jerome's, for example, by the time we signed the validation report, we were well into DD. In the case of Okotoks, it was early schematic. So it really varies. It depends on the project. It depends on the project timelines. From planning, we go to construction, which is you know, fairly straightforward, and then the warranty period. In terms of tools, um, I will speak briefly about scheduling, what that looks like, prefabrication and BIM. Scheduling, um, I think it's well documented that sound decisions made at the onset of a project will have a profound impact on how the project goes in the later phases of the project. So our ability to impact a project is really, um, it's really important that the planning at the onset is carefully done. And the advantage of an IPD process is that you have everybody at the table from day one. So trade input, you know, general contractor input is all available to the team. So which is why, you know, it's, it's, it's important and, 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 and part of the success of the IPD project come specifically from this issue. Uh, a traditional critical path method, you know, it's a more linear approach. It's harder to get into the details of the day-to-day -day operations. You know, a traditional the traditional critical path method um, is, is more focused around, you know, keeping your eye on the milestones, but the breakdown of tasks doesn't occur in the same manner as an IPD project does. 
Full planning is a very important part of IPD. This is something that, you t that, that I'm more familiar and more used to seeing in a construction site um, and, and as a way of orchestrating construction activities. But pool planning is a key uh, tool in, the, in an IPD process where, and this is how scheduling occurs. So the different colors come, have to do with the different disciplines. So in, in a pool planning process, typically, you know, each discipline will be assigned a color. Uh, you write the stickies, you put them on the board, you commit to a breakdown of activities and when you can deliver them, you own the tasks. And with that, you know, there's accountability, which is critical to, um, you know, meeting deadlines and really working collectively as a team. So in the case of St. Jerome's, uh, the pool planning process was done both digitally through Last Planner and with, you know, handwritten stickies. Uh, and, and it was really moving, you know, from one system to the other. And this is an image of, of us in the, in the big room in the St. Jerome's project, you know, working through the, through the schedule, really owning every part of the schedule and every task. This was reviewed on a bi-weekly basis and updated on the off weeks when we were not um, together. And the form pool planning, and you know, when this is done digitally, you can really easily track performance. And that's what the numbers on the screen reflect, right? How many of those stickies did we fulfill on? You know, how many of the tasks that we set out to accomplish did we actually complete on time? And so recording this and making this transparent and visible really encourages um, high performance and, and a high degree of accountability. It is well known that um, non-farm productivity has increased significantly over the past 50 years. While construction productivity has uh, taken a different path. And I'll, I'll speak to that in more detail. So how do we, so IPD really looks at productivity. You know, how do you streamline productivity? How do you become more productive? And that's done through collaboration, lean methods, and the use of technology. Lean originated with the Toyota uh, company in the 60s and 70s. And the main principles behind lean, and I'm sure you know, all of us uh, and all of you have heard about lean and, and, and use lean methods. But in the context of, of IPD, lean is about eliminating waste, minimizing uh, the inventory, maximizing an effective flow, um, you know, pull production from a customer demand is about meeting customer requirements and designing a process that does that and also designing a process that allows you to do things right the first time and avoiding rework. It's about empowering the team members and all of those that participate in the process. It's about partnering with the trades and it's really about creating a culture of continuous improvement. Lean and sustainability, you know, a world that is, 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 is incredibly important um, and becoming, you know, more crucial to our practice and our day-to-day -day, um, uh, work. Uh, lean in the context of, of reducing overproduction, waiting times, uh, inventories, you know, extra processing. So what does lean look like in construction, right? Is, is, as you can imagine, you know, the, the other version of this, when you don't prefabricate, you know, having miles of conduit on site to be cut and bent and assembled on site, you know, versus building them in a shop and bringing them to the site. This is a coffer ceiling, the National Art Center, uh, a project that was completed uh, over a year ago now in, in Ottawa. These triangular shapes are, are pieces of the ceiling assembly. All of this was done off-site. This is uh, timber from BC. Um, so these triangles and, and you know, how do you uh, uh, assemble the M&E services? How do you put in you know, the, 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 the sprinkler lines, the light fixtures? How do you do all of that 
And the quality control associated with that is also of key importance. So this is, these are the coffers as they're being um, installed on, on site, you know, with the crane and lifting them into place. And this is the final product, right? And as you can imagine, you know, all of the efficiencies associated, you know, with prefabricating significant components of a project. And this is uh, the, the finished building, uh, the views from the outside. How do we use BIM? And how does BIM work in the context of an IPD? Um, construction is, is one of those, you know, uh, when, you, when you review this chart, you know, construct, the construction industry is among one of those industries that is least digitized. And it's hard to believe, you know, when we live in a world of computers, um, but it is uh, a reality. And I apologize. I'm um, here. Um, so it's not just BIM for the sake of BIM. You know, it, it's, it's BIM thinking about a, a series of tools, not just Revit, but the whole slew of, of uh, software platforms that are out there and thinking about them, not just from an architectural and a design point of view, but how you know, that, that what, what I use during the design process can help the trades and can help the client. So it's really connecting all of the phases of a project and thinking about BIM from that perspective. At Diamond Schmidt, um, we've been, um, we were early adopters of BIM and, and we're, we're excited about, you know, all of the things that are out there and we're using them all. Um, so for us is this interlinked pieces of software to support this overarching flow of building information and get the most out of data. So you know, we're using Safaria for energy modeling and daylighting studies. We're using Eurofus for room data sheets, space planning, equipment track, uh, um, tracking. We're using uh, Navisworks for class detection. And we're using Grasshopper, Dynamo, and, and Revisto in, in for all of the different capacities that that software has. Um, so how do we optimize the benefit of BIM? Um, in an IPD contract, um, the model is owned by everyone. So we don't have the, the typical liability issues that we encounter uh, in other contract types. So the model is shared and developed by many disciplines, not just the consultants. So trade partners can have access to the model early on so that when it comes to detailed plumbing layouts, for example, we don't necessarily need to wait in the, until the mechanical you know, consultants are done, right? There's an opportunity to have overlaps that other contract forms don't allow. Um, this is an example of a project that, that is finishing construction now in Texas is a performing arts building. This is you know, what, what the, the, the structural systems look like when you isolate them. Um, these are the mechanical systems. These are um, the, the full combined model right, where, where clash detections becomes incredibly uh, useful, right? And it's navigating the model, understanding and anticipating conditions that we know are going to be problematic on site. This is again the combined model. Um, so, a little bit more detail on BIM. You know, in an IPD project, models are hosted locally on each consultant server. We have dedicated VPN connections that link the model. We need to watch the setup for. Uh, um, the internet setup because uh, there is a need for significant speed when you're running complex models. Um, there's also has to be clear protocols in terms of, uh, you know, who models what, just to make sure that, uh, that, that we don't have conflicts on, on that end. Um, have your, all of your BIM managers connected and talking frequently. That, that's very important to the success of the process. And early BIM 
uh, adoption within the construction industry. So allow for those overlaps, talk to the trades, understand what software makes sense, you know, and come from there uh, as, you, as you develop your workflow. Uh, compensation and tracking systems. Let me uh, touch on that. Um, so in terms of the, the possible outcomes in an IPD project, um, so there are four scenarios on the screen. Uh, the first one is where you establish a target cost and a profit. And in the first scenario, which is your ideal, or I guess one of the ideal scenarios is where the project is delivered for the target cost and the profit is earned as planned. The second scenario is where the client is at risk for amounts beyond the profit pool. So we went slightly over target cost, so therefore our profit is reduced. So the blue, sorry, just to be clear, the blue represents the profit, the yellow are the direct costs plus the overhead. In the instance of the third bar, uh, we were super efficient. We were able to actually access greater profit margins because we were so effective in our performance. The fourth scenario is not a good outcome. There is no profit, uh, right? And in this instance, there are serious performance issues, which is not at all where you want to be. So how does it work? You know, how do you structure your fee in an IPD process? How do you, you know, establish uh, what your costs are? So you create these charts. So each company creates a chart like this, where uh, you list the people that are going to be involved in the project, you identify their salaries, their CPP benefits, their holidays, and all of the costs of having you know, that person um, be available to the project. Then you look at the cost of running you know, your office, like you know, the rent, the, the... but you um, take aside your own company profit and you establish a profit for the project. And you, you combine all of that information in this chart. And then uh, as a team, we assemble an overall chart that identifies all of the costs associated with each company. So in this chart, um, the yellow represents the participate, all of the, the teams that are participating, sorry, um, the, the, the chart at the top is expresses the, the, the cost in a percentage format and the chart at the bottom illustrates uh, the cost as an amount. And then you structure your chart so that you identify the different project phases. So validation and all of the different um, stages through from validation onwards. So, um, so with that information, you know, that information is available to all of the parties at all times. So that's one very important element of IPD, a complete transparency in terms of numbers. So, um, and also it's important that, that that information is reviewed on a regular basis. So, um, so once you've established, you know, uh, what your anticipated cost and profit are going to be, that becomes your forecast. And then on a monthly basis, you check that chart and that's where you um, uh, review what your actual expenditures are and actual performances relative to the forecast. And this is how you monitor where you are and this is where how you monitor and correct behaviors or performance issues so that you can get the project on the right track. Um, so extensive tracking, right? that, that's a very important part of IPD. You're constantly measuring and you're constantly providing feedback on performance. Uh, and, and you're actually, you know, being a, you're a, with that level of tracking, you're also able to identify opportunities for improvement. Uh, so there are many uh, tracking systems, and I'll get into the details of each a little bit. So there's a monthly dashboard, there is the risk and innovation logs, there's eight threes, and it's really about uh, really understanding what you're doing and how you're doing it. The monthly dashboard, 
um, is that it, it, it reflects, uh, you know, where you are in terms of health and safety, innovations, value adds, total cost, schedule risk, et cetera. Um, there's also a, a, a risk, innovation, and value add logs. And then you, this is where uh, you identify, you know, uh, opportunities as they arise and you identify a cost and you identify when, you know, you need to make a decision associated with elements of a project that you want to change, that you want to add, uh, or you want to modify. And 8.3, all it is, is a, uh, a document that summarizes a decision so that it doesn't get buried or left behind in minutes of meetings is where you, um, um, for example, in the case of St. Jerome's, we were evaluating uh, whether to have ducted return along the corridors or use undercuts uh, in, the, in the suite doors. And so there was an extensive study uh, done to assess which way to go. Right, so and so you will have a group of people really getting to the bottom of all of the elements of the resolution of that issue, and that is what gets recorded in an 8.3. And in a project, there are many of, of these. Uh, so that if you do need to go back, right, you are not sorting through uh, weeks and weeks and months of minutes, you know, you're able to identify the issues and with all of, in a, in a very comprehensive way. Um, I'll just jump into a case study. I've chosen to share uh, St. Jerome's because the project is, is, com is, is complete. Um, and um, uh, in terms of the team composition for St. Jerome's University, um, and actually before I get into that, uh, St. Jerome's University is part of the University of Waterloo, is one of the co-founders of the University of, of Waterloo. Um, the the it's a 47 million dollar project complex project the owner uh did extensive research in terms of what delivery format they wanted to engage in uh it was originally going to be a p3 the project had been budgeted at 60 million dollars we were able to deliver it for 47 uh, with more program, uh, which is really an incredible outcome for, for the owner. Um, in terms of uh, the parties to the contract, uh, it was us, we work closely with Graham Construction, uh, mechanical electrical consultants, Gafari was our IPD adv advisor, and we had a number of trades that were also party to the contract. Um, why IPD? Um, the owner was wanted to colla a, a truly collaborative process. The owner wanted absolute transparency and wanted to be very hands-on. They wanted to be involved in the process, in the design, in the construction, and it, it was the, the university is all about community and is all about uh, collaboration. So it was the right model for for them and they were an incredible uh, partner in, in the process. So collaboration in this diagram, you know, at the very top, I think it's a, the, the world at the top is one that is very familiar, where, where you have an architect and a team of consultants associated or, or led, you know, uh, by the, the architect as a prime consultant, you have the owner and a, a number of, of, of groups under, under um, the owner and the general contractor and, and all the trades. The model at the bottom of the diagram, you know, is a much more um, integrated model where um, there is a, you know, IPD projects have a common uh, project insurance. Uh, the, the, the contract is one that is a collaborative contract. Uh, there is a shared risk and reward model. It's a transparent process and I've, you know, I've talked about that at great length and that has collaborative uh, methodologies. Um, so how does that, how does IPD look like every day? You know, we were organized in what's called PIP teams, which is the project implementation teams. Um, each, so the, so the PIP teams are typically, you know, you have a mechanical electrical team, you'll have an envelope team, a site team, and it, it varies uh, depending on the project. But those clusters or groups of people 
um, are responsible for they have a budget so you take the overall budget and you create buckets and you 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 give each group a bucket um, and there's tons of flexibility in terms of you know the 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 uh, depth of that bucket and you you can switch you know money from one bucket to another but you start with a bucket allocated to to that to that scope um, so each uh, pit uh, creates and updates a, a, a portion of the schedule and their response, they have a responsibility towards the master schedule. They develop design details, uh, um, specifications, constructions, means and method. And they, they are operational from the beginning of the project right through to the end. They also produce minutes of, of the meetings and they report back to the overall team at the big room meetings. Uh, the PMT I've already uh, touched on is, is that core team that effectively manages the process and the pit teams. And so, you know, I've already talked about some of, of those clusters. Uh, you also see interior finishes, you know, as a cluster, the landscape as a cluster, or a site is all, often uh, a cluster. This is what the big room or the, the meeting agenda look like. We met in the case of St. Jerome's on a bi-weekly basis. These are highly structured uh, days. They were, we met on two consecutive days. Uh, it, took a lot of, it takes a lot of effort to create these agendas. As you can imagine, the cost of bringing all of the people into our room is, is extensive. So careful management of the schedule is very extremely important to the successful delivery of a big room um, process. Uh, this is what the big room looked like. Uh, space needed to be large enough to hold a couple of dozen people and there's infrastructure required to support the work that takes place in the room. Uh, where you place the big room becomes important. And in our case, uh, the majority of the consultant team was in Toronto. The contractors' uh, offices were Mississauga, but the client group was in Kitchener, Waterloo. So we settled on Mississauga as the location for the big room to try to minimize this. Uh, and sorry, um, but the, the big room switched to uh, the site in, in Kitchener, Waterloo, because that's you know it's it's, it's what makes sense during during construction. Um, this is uh, a little bit of, of the infrastructure required. We needed a printer, we, had to, we needed the ability to print the pole plan, we needed uh, boards where we could write um, and we can um, record issues. Uh, we needed mock-up space and the image on the right hand side at the bottom is an image of the big room once we move to the site. Uh, the mock-ups, extremely important. Uh, in a student rest, uh, 360 beds, uh, roughly you know 60% of the area was given to the big to the to the uh, rooms. So understanding the furniture, understanding the the efficiencies in the room became extremely important. And we had the ability to create this very low tech uh, mock-up, but we used it extensively uh, to to really understand the the, the bedrooms. Uh, and that translated into uh, efficiencies so, so that we can shift area from the rooms to the amenity spaces, which were of extreme importance to the client. Um, in terms of the location, as I mentioned, part of the University of Waterloo, very tight site. Um, uh, the property line in white, uh, the buildings, the, the, the existing original buildings in dark gray, parking lots on light gray, and um, a creek uh, on the right-hand side. So tight site, a significant amount of program to be added. Um, tying back to the conversation about lean and the Toyota uh, model of production and, and seven ways, uh, which really speaks to early design and how critical it is to really, really drill into as many options as possible. Don't settle for the first or the second, really explore and, and, and have everyone in the team participate in the process by providing insight into the many aspects of site planning 
um, and connecting, you know, building massing, early design with things like side access, you know, where are the cranes going to go? You know, uh, what about form work? You know, is one shape more effective than the other? And really, you know, at, at, during the very early days of a process, understanding those elements, which you typically, in a more linear process, you don't come to understand until much, much later in the process. We settled on uh, a scheme where the, the green um, squares uh, are illustrating courtyards. Uh, if you remember the footprint of the original campus, uh, there were these two courtyards. So in terms of expanding the fabric of the existing, um, um, site, the existing campus, we settled on, on a perhaps, you know, initially, well, you know, we, we didn't think that triangular shapes were going to make any sense. But after you know an extensive site planning and massing process and validating of the shapes against all of the practicalities that I talked about, we settled on an extension of the existing fabric and um, and a building shape that fit well within the parameters of uh, the site. And the, the so the student residents sat on the left hand side of the site while the academic building. Um, which is the other component of the project, was located to the north of the site. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this extension of the, of the courtyard and, and more closely right, the relationship of that open space and the layout of the rooms, uh, you know, in these triangular shapes that I've already discussed. The ground floor plan, uh, Strictly uh, amenity spaces open to the entirety of the uh, of St. Jerome's University, um, and um, the typical uh, levels we had six levels of this typical floor plate uh, rooms around the perimeter of the triangle, central core of bathrooms, a combination of single rooms and double rooms at the perimeter, central elevator core, and you know, a repetition of the same triangle that we had on the other side. Uh, the mock-ups I've talked about, you know, the, the efficiencies around that we gain with the um, careful planning using the mock-ups as a tool. And these are uh, views of the final rooms, the single room, the double room, the dawn's room, and, you know, the quality of amenities, amenity spaces uh, this is uh, the, the common shared kitchen and uh, some of the, the um, other amenity spaces more associated with, you know, free play. And, and this is a gymnasium, which was also a multi-purpose room. Uh, the other building was the academic building, uh, classroom building, 300 seat auditorium on this side, 125 seats on this side, atrium uh, at the entrance. Uh, lounge, you know, largely just uh, flexible meeting and lounge space on this side. The second floor, uh, this is the second level of the large auditorium, the 125 seat classroom here and smaller classrooms on the other side. This is a view of that um, lounge space and the ground floor and the access to the 300 seat classroom on this side. Um, so coming back to, you know, um, the design and, and, and the process. So all of this design work happened, uh, some, you know, in our office on our own, some within the, 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 the big room environment. And so coming back to the pit teams and how we work, the pit teams, it's very much like having design assist, but for the entirety of the project. And, and so what, how did, what did that look like when it came to uh, right further into the designs, when we move from SD, DD, and into the contract documents? So we sat around the table, we started to develop these details, we sat with the trades and allowed the trades to really get into, okay, you know, how do we do this? Is this the right, what is the right uh, air vapor barrier? What is what is um, 
you know, what are the, do we have the right products? Do we have the right sequence? You know, what, when are we building this? Is it going to be at minus 18 or is it going to be done in the summer? And, and really, you know, having that level of conversation, which is, you know, not the norm uh, with other delivery methods. Um, as I mentioned, switching products, you know, from blue skin to a transparent uh, a vapor barrier, you know, and, and why? Why do we want to do that? You know, and, and the suitability of the products and understanding construction at a level that, that is, is very unique to a, an IPD process. Um, and, and really, you know, having the trades be part of the design team, you know, not, not the, the recipients of decisions, but really active participants in terms of how the, the, the building was documented and how the building was detailed. And decisions uh, such as components, for example, of, of the envelope, you know, there was an extensive study done around operable windows. The, the, the owner, the client was very concerned about operable windows in a student residence um, on, the, on, on the seventh floor, right? And so it was the idea of one of the trades to suggest the road events, you know, as an alternative to uh, an operable window. And, and, you know, working with the trades and with the owner, uh, to end with the eight threes as we documented this decision, you know, what are the advantages of one versus the disadvantages? And understanding airflow, you know, through a road event, you know, visiting buildings that have it, speaking with, with owners that had installed these previously, understanding capital costs, and really, you know, doing a very comprehensive analysis of, of, of a component of the project. Um, and really, you know, all of this with 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 the the deliberate outcome of creating outstanding environments, right? So a lot of process, you know, a lot of collaboration. But at the end of the day, this is why you know we we do what we do, and it's really about right creating um, you know great places for people. Um, I've been, I'm now on my, my second um, um, IPD in terms of, uh, you know, having been fully involved in, in St. Jerome's and fully involved in the Okotoks project and only peripherally involved in the other IPDs. Uh, you know, we have a much larger team uh, in, in Ontario that is, is delivering those. Um, it's been a tremendous, um, a pleasure for me to have been part of, of these two projects. And if, if I can, you know, summarize some of the lessons that I've learned and, and, and is the people that are involved in an IPD, it, it, it's incredibly important that those uh, team members that your, your company selects to participate in an IPD process really want to collaborate. Leadership is extremely important. Right, it's it's having people in the room that have been at it for some time and understand, um, you know, what the world looks like when it's not a collaborative process. So that you embrace, so that when you join an IPD project, you you really embrace collaboration. You know, it doesn't work to have people in the back of a room with their arms crossed questioning the process, right? We, we really need to kind of step in and embrace the process. And, and when you see that is when IPDs can be incredible, right? Um, another lesson uh, is, and you, I often see this in, in, the, in the big rooms, is, is sometimes the answers don't come from, um, you know, like in, in, in the case of an architectural issue, you know, it is very common to have engineers, trades, other people suggest solutions. And it's, it's you know, if you have a thought and if, if, if you think of a solution, you know, for a problem that, that might not typically be, you know, um, your expertise, it doesn't matter, right? An IPD um, process, an environment, um, is safe and, and 
so don't wait, you know, just, just jump in and offer solutions. And it's in that openness that great things can happen. Uh, another, I think, important lesson or, or, um, for future IPDs um, is have as, as many partners as, as you can, right? It's, it's knowing, you know, having more people at the table is not a problem, is actually an advantage. You know, having the drywall trade, concrete and steel, you know, having expertise in the room is it, it can be a, um, a key contributor, you know, to to the process. In in Saint Jerome's, um, uh, I remember, you know, it, it initially not all of us had had been on an IPD before, so the, there was a warm up time, and you know, for us to get onboarded, to to go through a training process. And it, you know, it took some time for us to come together as a cohesive team. And as time went on, we became more cohesive. And by the end of the job, you know, we had, you know, we we were we were um, collaborators, right? We and not to a point where we were ready to move on to the next job, right? But like that, we had managed to build the kind of camaraderie that was ready to take on the next challenge on the next project and if you can accomplish that then i think you know you you have succeeded um, that's all i have in terms of my presentation i'm happy to take on questions i didn't i wanted to leave it there because I've, i think i'm running slightly over time but uh, thank you so much for for listening and and um, happy happy to answer questions Thank you very much, Anna Maria. And we do have a few questions that have been posed. Um, one is how all the tracking works. Who, who does that? It's, it sounds like a lot of work. And so is, like, is there a team administration that everybody shares or the architect does it or how does that work? Um, for example, uh, the resource, like, you have to use technology uh, because like to minimize that so that it doesn't fall on, on you know one team's court right like there's 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 technology there that facilitates that so that for example where right, multiple parties can access the same uh excel chart at the same time right so that you're not having to give the contractor like each company is giving individual files right so so once you set up certain mechanisms so that you can uh, you can minimize that right uh, um you know your sharepoint site the linking of files um some of like the 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 um the 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 charts that i showed you um like the monthly dashboard in the case of saint jerome's that was done by graham right they, they consolidated all of the inputs the budgets were are typically done by you know or, or the contractor will be responsible for consolidating all of the budget information provided by the different pit teams right so they'll assume responsibility of that the scheduling like the the pool planning process for example in the case of st jerome's we all had access to last planner so we like each uh, individual consultant or trade would input their own um uh to do's right so I, again like i think it, it, it's part of setting of, of setting out the framework right you you there is there's a fair amount of effort and time at the front end of an IPD to set up your protocols so that you can be really efficient, right, and not duplicating work. So, so all of the philosophy of IPD, you need to apply that, right, to the structuring of the tracking. Um, if I if that answers uh, the question. Well, that's a good segue probably to one other question. Somebody's asking about time spent on the project, whether it, how it compares to kind of a regular uh, conventional delivery method, um, how much time the architects end up spending, do you find? Um, there's a lot of time, 
there's a lot of time in, in, in an IPD. I, I um, uh, initially, you know, when when we we when you come from a, from a you know like a lump sum or yeah other other um, or a CM or right you're not used to being in a room <laughs> for two consecutive days because you're used to being in your office right doing the work and but I think it's a mindset at the beginning and it's part of the learning curve like yes there are more hours dedicated to meetings but that there is a purpose to that right and 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 um i haven't done a comparison in terms of you know x number of hours to x number of hours you know between one um delivery method versus another but the fees on an ipd like if we compare it from that end the fees of, on, a, on an ipd are similar to the fees on other projects right so i would say when you do the final math an IPD is not necessarily more um, expensive or, or the fees in an IPD aren't necessarily greater than in a regular process. Maybe the time is just spent in different ways. Exactly, yeah. Um, uh, do you find that some team members rely on other parties too much, um, participate less, or have you found generally that the collaboration has worked well? Uh, it doesn't always. I, I, um, I, the, the, the onboarding process is very important. The training is very important. You know, in, in the beginning of St. Jerome's, you know, it felt like there was a lot of training. You know, I, I just wanted to get on with the work that I know to do, right? I just want to do the design work. Why are we having all these sessions, right? And you know, we, why do we need to learn so much about lean? And why do I, you know, and why are we doing so many team building exercises? And, and right, and, but it, it's, it's, it's part of learning a new behavior right it's it's because you because there is a, a different way of behaving in the room and and after you know and at the beginning the the ipd coach would would um, um call us on on the like if somebody displayed a behavior that wasn't you know true to an ipd spirit and he, he was very quick to say in a in a in a different delivery method that works, but in this one, you know, we need this from you, and and right, and 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 also, if it doesn't work, then you need to replace team members. Like you 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 and 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 you know, don't shy from that, right? And IPD is not suited for for everyone. There are some people that really enjoy that dynamic. There are others that don't. So recognize that early, I think, is what becomes really important. How are the team members initially arrived at? Or to, to, to read the question specifically, um, when and by whom the parties involved are selected? Must be a lot of trust involved. Yeah, and and so, um, so so first of all, an architectural team has to be appropriately represented. So it, there, you cannot send one individual representing the architectural group because the the pit structure, right? You have to have architectural representation in a number of pits because if you only bring one architectural member, then it doesn't work, right? Like that, you you cannot do the work in the room so you'll typically ha depends on the scale of, of of the project but you'll typically have three or four people from the architectural team so that, that represented in in the big room so that you can you know distribute responsibility so it depends in terms of expertise and who do you bring um the combination of 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 it depends on but sometimes program right like if if there's a complex program like you you need um so, sorry you need people that understand the programmatic requirements well right and also that have a certain amount of technical knowledge to interface with the trades so that they right so you need to be able to answer a lot of questions so there's a, a, a certain level of, of seniority uh, that's important right because of how of how the work is done but in terms of which companies are participating in the project 
is that sort of established and then the decision is made to go to an IPD process or an IPD RFP goes out or how does that selection process work? Five IPDs that we've done, we've responded to an RFP. So, so the RFP were soliciting IPD uh, and in some instances, um, in the case of, of St. Jerome's and the, the town of Okotoks, um, and Oakville actually as well. Um, I'm not, um, yeah, in those projects, it was an architect and contractor that submitted um, uh, as a, a response to an RFP. So they were looking for the team and it's, I've been in, in IPD interviews where they've also asked not just, not, not to see just the contractor and, and, and the architect, but the entire consultant team uh, like the, 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 the main consultant, like mechanical, electrical, structural, and the trades, like they attended IPD interviews where there were 25 of us that showed up to the interview. So, you know, for, 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 so the team, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, it's very important. I mean, you're not just typically like you know with other other projects. You would just interview the architect. Like, it doesn't. It, it's 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 a team. It's very much a team effort. So. Is the architect still basically acting as kind of the prime consultant? Yes, there is some. ERP. Yes, there there's definitely you are still responsible for for the overall coordination of a project, um, but it's it's not linear. Right, it's it's it happens in the room. It happens with all the consultants in in um, at the same time. The, the the trades, the contractor, you know, everybody is 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 in there. You know, um, providing feedback. So we still retain right the the what's still re responsible for coordinating the documents and and the engineering disciplines. That doesn't go away. It just happens in a slightly different format. Um, one person is saying, congratulations, impeccable presentation. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I was a little bit nervous about how today was going to go. <laughs> and they are asking, do you feel there's resistance from owners to adopt an IDP process? Um, uh, is there a certain amount of risk for the owners, an increased risk? They, you know, I, there is actually not a lot of risk because you've mitigated the risk of everybody, right? Like that's that's I find what is in there's hesitation to go to to an IPD uh, contract, but it's the opposite, right? By by having by having the contractor, the trades of the consultants. Um, you know, and, and having a, 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 a model where everybody's put their profit aside and at risk, you know, and, and having a, a very collaborative model and a contract that mandates collaboration is one of, if not the safest contract, right? Um, but it's new, right? And, and uh, I've spoken at many events about IPD and I keep speaking as <laughs> today because I firmly believe in that process. I sincerely hope that DC embraces that contract form wholeheartedly. And um, it's time. <laughs> and is there, so is there a way for people to get IPD training to prepare them for participating in Yes. that process i think that i've i've seen more and more um uh, ipd talks and ipd workshops i think they are a lot more now than there were you know four or five years ago so i would encourage you know everyone to to you know access some of those sessions and i, I think there's whether whether you know you engage in an ipd in the near future or not i think there are tools that we apply, I apply to other project types, like to a CM, to CM contracts. You know, there are there are a lot of. Um, it's very possible, right? In a in a design build context, in a CM context, to apply many many of these tools, and there's great merit in in applying these tools. So I would say, you know, 
hopefully, you know, the contract will be embraced and we will see many more of these projects, but there, there is a lot to learn from an IPD process. I, I, I really believe that. Great. Well, there were a lot more questions, but I think we probably should cut it off there and hopefully generally people got their answers through <laughs> through you responding to it. Um, yeah, no, I'm happy if, if people want to be get in touch with me, you know, via email or I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy. I'm, I, I'm very passionate about this process and, and, and if I can help, you know, move things forward in any way, I absolutely, I'm always available. And we're getting many thanks through chat and through the Q and A and I would like to give you a big thanks as well. No problem. And and for being our guinea pig as our first <laughs> virtual event. <laughs> and um, a reminder to our attendees, if you haven't already done so, and if you are looking for your AIBC uh, credit, if you're a registered architect, please give us your name and email address in the chat. And thanks all for participating. And hopefully we will have more of these virtual events coming up. Roxana, do you have anything to add? No, we're still getting more questions and uh, people are writing their names for AIBC registration. Thank you all for joining. It was great to have so many of you join uh, today's presentation by Ana Maria. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, you Anna Maria, as well. Thank you. Would you like to answer more questions, or I could if 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 um, I'm, I'm ha definitely happy. Yeah, I've got time. Okay, we will. Um, so. Um, have you managed how have you managed to achieve the big room virtually how is it working these days um with the technology that you know very much like today right it's 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 i think it's remarkable i think how as an industry we've been we've managed to operate remotely right and so you know we um we can uh, create pit team sessions you know we, we by 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 having uh, breakout sessions and, and we've, been, we've been able to 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 replicate you know it, it obviously is it's not the same right but but we, we keep running you know Okotoks keeps running in the case of Okotoks we have weekly uh, big room sessions and there are two consecutive days and 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 we're doing them like we have a commitment to deliver the project and, and we're going to. <laughs> so. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, do you want to read more questions? How do you assign an IPD coach? Is she or he a member of IPD or a third party? In the case of St. Jerome's, we had um, an IPD coach because um, only the contractor had done an IPD. So it was new to everyone, right? Everyone, everybody else. So, um, so between the, the art who, who, who led the Graham team and Gafari, uh, our IPD coach, you know, having both of them have extensive IPD experience, uh, it's the kind of support that, that we needed. So I'd say, what, if you, do you need an IPD coach or not? It depends on the experience within the team, right? Uh, in the case of um, um, the town of Oakville, for example, the, the, the town of Oakville project were done with Graham also. So part of the St. Jerome's team moved on to the town of Oakville project. So there was a lot of knowledge already right, within that team. So the need for, and, and then we also had a very knowledgeable client. So there was not a need for an IPD coach. 
right? So, so it, it really depends on, on, I'd say, on experience level. Um, and there are, um, you know, as it becomes more popular and as, as more companies deliver IPD projects, right? I, I think it, 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 um, it will vary, right, over time. Somebody's asking about the Emily Carr project and whether it would have benefited from being an IPD process. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think so. I, I think uh, it would have allowed us to have a more uh, collaborative process, right? Um, uh, it's it's a, a P3 environment presents some challenges in terms of how collaboration and how, actually more than collaboration, how uh, engagement with users, right? The, 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 there's, a, there's a fundamental difference in the framework. Right? So I'd say from that perspective, um, uh, for sure, right? Uh, I think um, it, it, it would have benefited from that end. Yeah, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I could read one uh, question. How insurance is addressed in an IPD contract? What type of insurance is required? There's a shared liability insurance. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. Can project size affect the effectiveness of an IPD, too big or too small, asking mainly for healthcare? Um, I say because there's a significant amount of process, the larger the project, um, so uh, the better, right? Just, just, it's, 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 it's um, I have not participated in a, in a, in a smaller IPD process. Uh, I know of, of many in Alberta, and I know that they're running them and they're running them effectively. Um, but as you can imagine, right, that the, because there's so much time spent on training and onboarding, it becomes more effective when, when the project's larger. But, Thank you. Uh, somebody else also asked this question. I understand every hour gets paid in IPD. How does people stuffing hours into a project get rectified? Um, so you, um, so when you're working on an IPD project, you log all of your hours right to the project. And then uh, before invoicing, the person that's in charge of, in, um, of the project will review all of the hours, right? And then we review that against progress. And, you know, like in an IPD project, you have to be um, aware of the kind of project that it is, right? And there's an accountability side to every hour that you put into the project and effectiveness. So, um, you know, you will be called on it if, if by the entirety of the team, if, if, if you are going outside of your forecasted hours, right? So, and it can happen, right? That, that you, you end up using more hours because, um, right? Something, something is needed in the project or there's a change uh, in the approvals process or there's a change, you know, that is unforeseen. But, you know, it's, 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 it's a completely open process, right? So, so, so you need to be true to your the commitment that you made and and the plan that you 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 laid out and that you declared, right? So, you have to be respectful of that of that framework and and honor right what, what you say you say we're going to do. But like I said, inevitably you can only forecast so many things, right? And and then there'll be changes, right? And, and things will happen in the project and your hours will go up and down. But what's important is that you track it, that you track it and you monitor it. And so if things are going in the wrong direction, you can voice your concern to the rest of the team and say, look, 
right? We're, we're, we're having to spend more hours on this thing because there's something that is not resolved or, or it's, it's, it's something that is outside of the project that is affecting us. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's a collective issue, right? It, it's, no, it's not really about you. It, it, it's, it, it has to be addressed within the larger team. So, sorry, in terms of the rectifying, um, right? If, if there are internal um, inefficiencies, right? Um, so we need to address those internally in the office, right? This is why before you invoice, you need to check the hours and how those hours were allocated, right? To make sure that you're being fair and, and reasonable with the hours that you are uh, invoicing for, right? So there is an internal check, but then there's also an external check you know, with a larger team. Thank you. Kate, do you wanna? I think we more? covered most of it yeah. in one way or another. Just looking through the chats. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. Thank you. Thanks all for attending. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, see you for the next uh, coming events. And thanks, Roxana. <laughs> Thank you for organizing the event. It's great. Okay. It was great having you as a presenter. <laughs>